<laughs> so today we have Dr. Karen Raphael speaking with us today. We're so grateful. Um, Karen is a recently retired professor who holds the rank of Professor Emerita at New York University. She is a psychologist, epidemiologist, and clinical research scientist who spent decades leading NIH-funded research on chronic pain. After being diagnosed with Parkinson's disease 13 years ago, Karen utilized her research training to keep up to date on PD-related published research, hoping to maximize her own quality of life and care. She currently provides leadership to two Facebook, Facebook groups and one focusing on identifying, translating, and discussing recently published PD-related research literature in patient-relevant ways. The other group focuses specifically on PD-relevant exercise research. She often meets virtually and one-on-one -on -one with people recently diagnosed with PD to help guide them toward the best possible evidence-based care and support. Karen is currently forming an online support group for people recently diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. We're so grateful you're here today. Thanks so much for joining us, Karen. Well, thank you so much, Eden, for inviting me. I'm really looking forward to this. And um, should I do my share screen now? Please. Or, okay, let me see if I can find the right screen. Okay. Technology is only great when it works. Yes, okay. All right, so you can see my screen? Not yet. Not yet. Oh, okay. I'm still seeing everybody. Okay. Oh, okay. I think I shared you. Um, let's try that one. There oh, we that. go. Okay. All right. Now, can people see um, a little capsule version of me or you have to direct them to do that? Nope, we can see you a little on the side. Okay. Very good. So um, shall I just get going? Of course. Thank you. Okay. Very good. So thank you, Eden. And uh, so as Eden said, I'm a person who's been living with Parkinson's, I guess, for around 13 years. And also my dad had Parkinson's and he lived pretty well into his early 90s with Parkinson's. So that's given me a lot of time to think and to learn about how to live better with Parkinson's. And I also remember watching my mom, and this was sort of when she finally went from a dial-up connection to uh, you know, a, a faster high-speed connection on the web, trying to sort through all the information that was out there. So I saw how hard it was for her at times. Now, again, because of my background, uh, I have the experience um, as a scientist and as a chronic disease epidemiologist to share with you my perspective, and I would say it's my skeptical perspective on how to make sense of new information about my, what might help us live better with Parkinson's, okay? And thank you to Eden and other folks from the PMD Alliance for giving me uh, the time and a forum to share my ideas. Now, a little warning, uh, I'm used to presenting to other scientists and to uh, lecturing to advanced graduate students. So, um, be prepared with your questions at the end and call me out, please, if I use language or terminology that's unfamiliar to you. Sometimes I'm in my own head and I forget that I have to explain in plain English what I mean. Okay, so let, let's start with that. Okay, so, so when we're living with Parkinson's, we want to know what we can do to improve the quality of our life, obviously. So where do we get this information? Well, obviously, uh, the clinician who treats us for Parkinson's is one source of information, but depending upon what kind of clinician we're seeing, whether they're a movement disorder specialist who has advanced training beyond the neurology training uh, in movement disorders, uh, they tend to be fairly up to date, especially if they've graduated recently, finished their fellowship recently. But if you're seeing a neurologist who treats many different kinds of neurologic conditions or any other kind of clinician, this American uh, system, healthcare system, doesn't really reward physicians for reading journals and keeping up with literature. You have to see patients, right? So 
you know, sometimes, uh, you know, you might ask a question that's or, an, or raise an issue that's been brought by your own uh, search out there and your clinician might say, well, your web search does not equal my years of medical training. I think that's the, the phrase you sometimes hear. And that might be true, okay? Or it might not be true, depending upon how up to date that clinician is. Okay, we have to recognize that they don't always have time to keep up with all that information. So I think that it's pretty empowering to imagine that we can make sense of new information ourselves about how to manage symptoms. And I'd like us to feel empowered. So what other, besides the clinician, okay, what other source of information might we use to figure out how to live a better quality of life? Obviously, we can talk to or read about uh, the experience of others who are living with Parkinson's. Uh, we're gonna probably go to the web. I certainly did, okay? And not all web-based sources are the same. I'd say that you're in pretty good shape if you're looking at information from some of the major PD organizations like PMD Alliance, okay? Um, you're less secure if you're looking at other alternative kinds of websites. And I would say I'm calling out Mercola.com because it's very popular and it has some good information, but it also has a lot of misinformation. Uh, same thing with blogs, uh, blog, blog spots or uh, online support groups where people are discussing things. Uh, I'm very familiar with Facebook groups for, I'm using the abbreviation here, PWP for people with Parkinson's. So get used to that little abbreviation that I'm going to use. So it's a nice group uh, from Health Unlocked. But again, the same problems. You'll get some good information and some less accurate information. You'll also see lay summaries of new research. Uh, you might subscribe to various lists um, and their press releases. And that can be a problem if the person who writes the lay language summary or for the average person uh, isn't really uh, scientifically trained themselves, okay? And in the same way that, yeah, you might wanna look at a research abstract, okay? Because those can be found online, but unless you have access to full text, and unless you want to really take the time to read that full text and try to understand it, which is really hard without the training, you may not know some of the caveats that the researchers have put in about, well, yes, we found this, but we still need to find out X, Y, and Z, all right? So how are we gonna make sense of all this information? Sometimes they're competing or contradictory claims about what's going to help our quality of life. And what kind of information am I talking about? Pres mm, prescription medications. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you can get some of that from your doc, but your doc has had that information probably filtered from a drug rep. Um, and even more important in terms of what I think of as lifestyle interventions are non-prescription supplements or so-called nutraceuticals. Uh, vitamins, uh, nutritional supplements, herbal formulations, uh, dietary programs, there are a number of them out there. Uh, some of them are controversial uh, or elements of diet, like what about caffeine, right? Uh, and of course, in terms of lifestyle, we can't neglect talking about exercise. And there are so many different kinds of exercise out there. So what makes this a skeptic's guide? A skeptic requires that new claims are backed by evidence and it can be confusing. But let me share with you a quote from one of my famous, uh, favorite uh, scientists out there who did a pretty good job at translating in his area. And he writes, what counts is not what sounds plausible, not what we would like to believe, not what one or two witnesses claim, but only what is supported by hard evidence, rigorously and skeptically examined. And I love this last line. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. OK, 
Okay, so now we're gonna take a minute to climb what I call the evidence tree, all right? This is a figure that is very popular in epidemiology, all right? In which as we climb up this tree of different kinds of evidence, we can make stronger inferences about a cause effect relationship. Said differently, the cause here that's potentially useful is some kind of lifestyle intervention. And the effect is what's gonna improve our symptoms and quality of life. And I'm gonna selectively go through various parts of this pyramid uh, as sort of a guiding principle for what we're gonna go through. Let's start with what's called in vitro studies. Okay, in vitro studies are what some people think of as test tube or petri dish studies. And they typically use cells that come from either animal or existing cell lines. Um, and they look at possible causes of PD and they try to attack these causes in the test tube or in the petri dish. What's good about these kinds of systems is that they're cheap and they're simple. And sometimes they can be used for drug discovery in certain disorders. But as the organ system becomes more complex, that Petri dish is not gonna do a good job in capturing that complexity. And what's more complex, the human brain. So, these findings don't replicate in people with Parkinson's. They don't translate well to people with Parkinson's. Let's go back to our pyramid and take a look at animal studies, still on that bottom rung. Okay, you see that little mouse. I, I kind of like mice, not everybody does. But they're probably one of the most commonly uh, commonly found uh, kinds of uh, studies that are there for people with Parkinson's. In now, mice don't get, or rats don't get Parkinson's. All right. So what happens is they create a model of Parkinson's either through chemically uh, inducing damage in the part of the brain that is damaged or missing neurons in people with Parkinson's. And sometimes they use genetic engineering. Um, but in my opinion, uh, I think the biggest false hopes are sometimes raised only to be dashed later um, when trying to replicate these findings in humans. And the problem is that animals um, other than humans, and maybe occasionally our closest primate relatives, we'll talk about that in a minute, they don't get Parkinson's. So they're dealing again with these artificial animal models. Now, sorry, okay. I just wanted to bring up an exception. I said, you know, animals other than humans don't get Parkinson's. There was one study that uh, came out in late 2020 in which a Steinomalgus macaque um, who was living in captivity looked like it had developed Parkinson's. It had the classic Parkinson symptoms of bradykinesia or slowness of movement, tremor, postural instability. And interestingly enough, it was responsive to uh, levodopa and apomorphine, which some of you may know is uh, an injectable or pump-driven uh, dopamine agonist. Um, and what was sort of interesting is this it was a 10-year-old monkey, all right? And they typically live up to 30 years in captivity. So I would have to say this was a young onset monkey with Parkinson's. So why do I say that you know, animals don't usually get Parkinson's. Well, a lot of it is because we, and to a lesser extent, our closest, closest primate relatives like that macaque, um, 
don't uh, have, we have dopamine neurons that have within them something called neuromelanin, which is what it makes them, what makes them appear black. Okay. And these neuromelanin containing neurons are particularly susceptible to any abnormal stress in the brain. Okay? And I'll just call it abnormal stress for now without getting more technical. Interestingly enough, neuromelanin is absent in the human brain at birth. And as we age, it increases. And maybe that has, gives us a little clue on why this is typically, Parkinson's is typically a, a disease associated with aging. So let's return to our evidence tree. Now, again, I'm not taking you through every step. We're gonna jump right up to what I think I wanna spend a little extra time going through is personal testimonials, because I think lots of folks rely on what other people have told them and what they themselves experience. And what are the limitations of that? It kind of seems obvious at first glance that well, personal experience should be the most relevant. We see personal testimonials like this, you know, uh, John Pepper, some of you may have uh, read his book in which uh, I think he's probably somewhere in his 80s right now. Um, and his book is an account of what he was able to do through fast walking and conscious walking. And he stresses that he hasn't been cured of Parkinson's, but he's reduced its symptoms to the level that he's able to live, as he says, a normal life, no worse than anybody else. And I just online found another quote from somebody who claimed that he was recovered from Parkinson's and has been free of it for six years. Again, that's that kind of extraordinary claim that requires extraordinary evidence, right? But he based his um, recovery plan on what he learned from a book that was written by a uh, very well-known book written by Norman Doge, called The Brain That Changed Itself, which is about the ability of our brain to in fact change itself or something that's been called neuroplasticity, right? So we've got these kinds of testimonials and our own experience. So what are the problems? Many of you may have heard about the placebo effect which is a perceived or actual health benefit that's caused by the expectation of a beneficial outcome. And it is influenced by prior experience. And it causes, interestingly enough, an actual change in dopamine, which is comparable to the response from therapeutic doses of levodopa. So this is really powerful in Parkinson's. And you can actually use techniques like what they call functional neuroimaging, where they can see parts of the brain that light up. And they can see that placebos activate various parts of the brain that you wouldn't think could be stimulated through a placebo. And optimizing the placebo response can certainly be beneficial to people with Parkinson's. And you know, some people joke and say, well, psychologists really rely on this for therapeutic relationships, right? But the problem is that it confounds or it confuses the interpretation of personal testimonial. Um, I wanna share with you a quote from uh, somebody who I consider the father of the biology of the placebo response, Benedetti. Uh, and he writes that hard science tells us that placebos can reduce symptoms like pain and muscle rigidity in Parkinson's, but the progression of the disease has been affected. For example, in Parkinson's, the neurons keep degenerating, even though for a while the symptoms can be reduced. So usually the placebo response is not robust and long-lived. Now bringing you to a second problem. And I thank Dr. Lori Mishley, who some of you may have heard of. Uh, she's a naturopath, a naturopathic physician, as well as having training in epidemiology, one of the most unusual combinations one could ever imagine. And um, what you're seeing here is a scatter plot of a year since diagnosis. She, had a, she has a very large sample, um, several thousand people by now. And she looked at 
the number of years since diagnosis, and their score on a scale that she created, which is self-report scale, called the PRO-PD. And what's really important is to see that in the first five years after diagnosis, there's a lot of variability in how people are doing. Some people are doing great, excellent. Okay. Some people that within those first five years are doing very poorly. So the problem is that we can't know what our symptom changes would be like if we weren't using that new intervention, that new treatment, that new lifestyle change. So maybe we're feeling better, but maybe it's because our Parkinson's has a rather benign force. Or maybe we're not feeling better with this new intervention that we're, we're doing or, or new diet or new exercise. Maybe we'd be doing even worse. So we think that the treatment isn't working, but maybe it is, or maybe it's not. It's really hard based upon personal experience. And uh, I'm reminded that uh, some people who have known me online and elsewhere uh, know that I exercise uh, two or three hours every single day. And I've been doing really well after 13 years. And a few years ago, people were saying, what's your formula? I don't sure, because I don't know whether I would have had a benign course without the exercise. I don't know how much I can ascribe to the exercise or the fact that I've been a vegetarian or any other aspect of my lifestyle. Another problem, and this is one of those situations in which I get to say, do as I say, not as I do, because these are just some of the supplements that over the course of my 13 years, I've managed to take for a while and then maybe stop taking or whatever. It's unlikely that you're only engaging in one intervention, one lifestyle intervention. If you're taking a bunch of things, multiple treatments tried all at once, it's pretty hard to sort out what's responsible for your change. Another major problem with personal testimonial is that, especially when you hear people saying they were cured of Parkinson's by a particular lifestyle intervention, we have to ask, were they correctly diagnosed with this progressive neurodegenerative condition? Okay. People don't look the same when they have Parkinson's, depending upon the stage at which they're seeing. There's, you know, the, the classic, presentation, and this is, I think, uh, a graphic that came from um, John Parkinson's who identified the syndrome uh, back in the 1800s. Um, yeah, some of us are exercising like crazy. Some of us have different presentations when our medications are working versus not. And some of us are not only using a walker, but might be using a wheelchair. But the problem is that there's an estimate that anywhere from 20 to 30% of people who are given a Parkinson's diagnosis by a specialist were wrongly diagnosed. So when somebody says they were cured, did they really have Parkinson's? You have to wonder. Returning to our evidence pyramid. I want to spend some time talking about the randomized control trial and what makes it different. And the only thing really above that is a review of multiple randomized control trials. And we're not going to spend much time talking about that, but science does require replication. Okay, So if there's only one trial out there, we have to be a little cautious until we see it replicated with a number of different uh, ways of measuring outcomes, types of people with Parkinson's that were allowed to be included in the study, the inclusion and exclusion criteria varying. But what makes a randomized control trial a randomized control trial? Okay, well, first of all, I said, if it's done well, and we're not gonna get too much into the specifics of that, but it allows for the strongest evidence about whether treatment's likely to improve symptoms or 
quality of life for people with Parkinson's. Now, in these trials, they're randomly assigned. That means people are assigned to two or more potentially helpful treatments, sort of like the flip of a coin. And what's good about that is that it allows us to assume that the groups at the beginning of the trial were essentially equivalent on symptoms and other kinds of characteristics at the start of the study. So that if at the end of the study, the end of the trial, we find differences between the groups, we can make the strongest possible inference that the differences were due to the groups getting different treatments rather than them being different from the start. Now, there are critiques about randomized controlled trials. Biggest one is they take so long and can be so expensive. And there seems to be a view that it's only these rich pharmaceutical companies that are gonna do these clinical trials. But in fact, that's really not the case. Um, I it was taking a look at a very recent publication which said that only 38% of neurodegenerative disease trials are really funded by industry. Um, but those industry trials tend to be a lot larger than the ones that are funded by private foundations or by the National Institutes of Health, the NIH. So in terms of, I would call them person days with people with Parkinson's, the pharmaceutical trials probably do account for about two thirds of clinical trials out there. What's really important to remember about randomized controlled trials, when you see results and you say, well, I tried that treatment and it didn't work for me. It makes people distrust science because the clinical trial doesn't really tell you how every person with Parkinson is gonna feel like at the end of the treatment even if they would have been eligible to enroll by having similar characteristics to those who are in that clinical trial. They really describe the likely outcome, the average person in the trial who received each of the different arms of treatment. And is there an average person with Parkinson's? What's the saying? You've seen one person with Parkinson's, you've seen one person with Parkinson's. The other problem is, it's pretty difficult to understand the probabilistic thinking that's underlying biostatistical testing in clinical trials. Now, here is where, when I talk about probabilistic thinking, if you took a statistics course or tried to get out of taking a statistics course when it was offered, you can take a nap on the rest of the slide. Okay. Now, I happen to love biostatistics, but I think I'm the exception. And one of the hard things to grasp is that probabilistic thinking. And unlike other areas of science like physics or chemistry, humans with or without PD respond differently to different treatments. It doesn't mean that every person with Parkinson's doesn't necessarily uh, share many aspects with others with Parkinson's, although it certainly can be different. But clinical trials use inferential statistics to determine the probability that the pattern of difference between the active and the new or control uh, versus the control treatment or the placebo treatment could have occurred if the reality is that there's no difference. So we start off by saying nothing happening, okay? This treatment doesn't work. And so what's the likelihood that we could have found what we found if the treatment doesn't work? Now, if a treatment effect is found to be statistically significant, and typically we use P of less than 0.05, which means the probability is less than five times out of 100, that we would have found this effect if, in fact, there was no effect, we're willing to say that we're comfortable for now in rejecting the idea that the treatment doesn't work and accepting the idea that the new treatment works better than the control or contrast treatments again, for the average person in the group under study and not for each and every person who could have qualified for the trial. 
And some of you who might be interested in sort of getting a fundamental on statistics may want to go back to this later and not worry about it too much now, take for now. Okay. But said differently, the probability of an improved symptom outcome increases for those receiving the treatment that's found to be statistically significant. And another saying that goes along with that is that statistical significance is a necessary but insufficient criterion for clinical significance. Okay. In order for a treatment to be clinically significant, it first has to be a non-chance finding. Now I'm gonna go through a very specific example, taking you through a couple of steps, okay? Now, some of you may have heard about mannitol, some of you not, but it is a generally recognized as safe low calorie sweetener and actually has a medicinal use uh, to decrease uh, pressure in the brain. And we start off by noting that in the early, I guess maybe it was around 2014, uh, an in vitro study, that's a test tube study, it found that mannitol interfered with the formation of these abnormal protein aggregates or so-called Lewy bodies, which are often found in the brain of Parkinson's. So something that a lot of scientists think is either the net effect or a cause of Parkinson's could be disrupted with mannitol. Then they did animal studies. They started off with a fruit fly study. Okay. And it found that when these fruit flies had uh, been induced to have a Parkinson's-like motor problems, when they were fed mannitol, they recovered from their motor problems. They could climb up the sides of the jar again. And then they did an animal mouse model. And they found that mice who had been given Parkinson's or something like Parkinson's, when they were injected with mannitol, they improved their motor function. Then we started seeing these really powerful personal testimonials of symptom remission. Here's a case report that actually appeared in a journal by Don McCammon. I'm 66 years old, had all the symptoms of Parkinson's. I started taking mannitol. After 30 days, I could stand and walk regularly. I gave the compound to others who had similar results. I have two patents pending on the compound. So maybe a little conflict of interest. But when I read this, something struck me a little funny. And I noticed that he had said that he had all the symptoms of Parkinson's. And I wrote him and I said, Don, who, who diagnosed you? And he said, oh, I, I was never diagnosed with Parkinson's. My brother had it. And I kind of had similar symptoms. So I figured that I had Parkinson's. So here's an example of the problem with personal testimonial. Okay. I suspect McCammon never had Parkinson's. And moving on to another model of what happened uh, with Manitol. In the Jerusalem Post, there appeared a report of an Israeli man who, fed, who had Parkinson's, Dan Vaselli, and he was a high-tech startup entrepreneur. And as he started to do his own reading of the research literature, he was getting frustrated because it looked like there was a lot of science that needed to be done that wasn't being done on substances like mannitol. So he read those studies and he was frustrated with that undone science because it really was not gonna be, a trial was not gonna be funded by a pharmaceutical company because there was no profit incentive. So he created a crowdsourcing platform called Clinicrowd where patients could report their own experience using Manitol. And in 2018, the group reported that more than 1,500 Parkinson's patients from 42 countries had reported using Manitol on the Clinic Crowd platform. But unfortunately, 
only 78 kept reporting for six months or more. And okay, among those 78, 56% reported improvement. But I say, what about everybody else? Now, it did serve to get enough publicity around the issue and the problem of unknown science. And in late 2018, uh, Hadassah Medical Center in Jerusalem funded a small clinical trial. They planned to enroll 30 people to either, well, 60 people in total to be randomly assigned, again, a clinical trial, to receive mannitol or dextrose, which is a looked and tasted similar to mannitol. But pandemic struck. And as for a lot of clinical research, enrollment became so difficult. And only 27 were actually randomly assigned, and only 22 completed a five visit study. And as is not surprising for a small study, they didn't find significant differences between the two groups. And at this point, no further studies on mannitol are planned. And I remember when, you know, the first reports on mannitol were coming out and people were so excited about it. And so many people were saying, oh, this has just changed my life. But in fact, there's no further research on mannitol. And people have stopped taking it pretty much in general. I want to bring your attention to a group that I've been involved with, uh, which uh, Eden mentioned at the beginning, which is uh, it's a Facebook group. So if you're not on Facebook or don't want to be on Facebook, you want to have access to it, and I don't blame you. But uh, it's called the Parkinson's Research Interest Group, and it's been funded for about seven or eight years right now. I'm sorry, it started about seven or eight years ago. And we talk about new research that's out there, and in particularly, I try to translate it so that folks who are not research specialists can make sense of it. Um, I can post this again, that particular uh, URL, uh, that website address, uh, if those of you who are interested in joining it, because you do have to request that you join, it's not an open group. Uh, you can find a lot more about new research on Parkinson's in a really vetted way and critical way. So somebody might say, is this you know, kind of skepticism really very pessimistic view? I don't think so at all. Okay. We have to recognize that Parkinson's was only recognized as a distinct clinical entity a little over 200 years ago. That's not very long in the history of science or medical research. Okay. And levodopa wasn't available until the mid-1960s. That's pretty recent, right? That was in, within my lifetime, at least. And that was a game changer because I can only imagine that I probably would be in a nursing home right now if it weren't for levodopa. So now we're looking at better ways to absorb levodopa, to deal with some of the side effects of levodopa, to deal with periods in which levodopa is not working to extend its effective action, okay? Recognize that other treatments like surgeries, like deep brain stimulation, that's a much more recent innovation. And it's even more recent that we've recognized the importance of exercise for symptom improvement. And I have in parens that disease modification is still unclear, but when I make that statement, people might, point out 20 other people who said, oh, it's disease modifying. We can talk about that later if anybody has questions about why I don't think the evidence is there yet for disease modification, okay? It first was modeled in rodents, right? And now it appears to do pretty well, symptomatically at least, uh, for people with Parkinson's. And there are so many different therapeutic approaches on the horizon. Um, you know, there's different kinds of cell replacement therapy, there's infusions and gene therapies, um, and there's a new vibrational glove out there developed at Stanford that a lot of people are talking about. Lots of different future possibilities. But notice I haven't used the word cure yet. I think that slow progression is a really good goal. The likelihood of people 
who currently are living with symptomatic Parkinson's, having that really permanently cured, that seems kind of unlikely to me. But I'd be very happy if we can slow progression. So, so far, I think we can assume that since the biggest risk factor for Parkinson's is aging, lifestyle factors that are known to be associated with healthy aging probably have the best chance of slowing progression. Here we're talking number one about exercise. Mediterranean diet among the diets uh, is probably the best way to go as far as what we know so far. And sleep is so important for us to clean out some of the gunk in our brain. That's one of the many things that happens during sleep. And find out about practicing good sleep hygiene. If you don't know, you can look it up or we can talk about it. Okay, now another critical lifestyle factor that we can modify is social isolation and loneliness. Okay, the difference between the two, I think is social isolation is usually having fewer network ties, living alone, having minimal social contact, where loneliness is more that subjective emotional state of just a dissatisfaction or discrepancy between your desired and your actual social relationships. Now, talking about people in general and social isolation and loneliness, there's a study that the epidemiologist in me that knows about this national study that's done every decade or so, which is nationally representative, large sample called the NHANES. When they compared participants who weren't socially isolated to those who were the most isolated, the most isolated had a 33% increased risk of death from all causes during a 20 year period in which they were followed up. Now that is as deadly as mortality from smoking, from not exercising, or being morbidly obese. Okay. Well, what's the specific consequence for people with Parkinson's? Okay, this, I, forgive me, I know this is a little hard to read, but let me try to interpret it for you. Uh, it's from, again, uh, Michelle's group. And this is that pro-PD score in which we're looking at a reduction, which is good, or a worsening, which is bad. The best outcomes were associated with all the lifestyle measures she looked at, exercise 30 or plus minutes, seven days a week. The worst possible outcome after adjusting for years since diagnosis and a bunch of other factors is I am lonely. And the they kind of balanced each other out in terms of about 300 points, either doing having reduced symptoms or increased symptoms. The negative effects of loneliness on PD symptoms is at least as great as the positive effect of exercising seven days a week. Doesn't mean I'm telling you that if you're not exercising, just be social, do both. Okay. One more study I wanna mention is because it involved PMD Alliance. They did uh, a survey, uh, the results were published in 2022, in which subscribers uh, or affiliates with PMD Alliance uh, were asked to complete an online survey about specifically how the pandemic affected your social support. And unfortunately, only about 10% of those who were reached completed the survey. But those who reported decreased outside support during the pandemic had more depression and anxiety symptoms, and they reported increases in several non-motor and motor symptoms. So the bottom line, that lifestyle factors associated with healthy aging probably have the best chance of slowing progression. Don't forget how critical social connections are, especially as we're moving through, the, hopefully, the latter days of the pandemic. So if you have a phone or a computer for virtual meetings or still drive and feel comfortable meeting with others, find the support that diminishes 
your loneliness. They can be support groups as advocated very actively by PMD Alliance, but they don't have to be just that. They can be PD-centered exercise or dancing or singing groups. They can be just calling your best friends that you haven't seen in a while. So say yes to connect whenever you can. It's gonna make your life so much richer. Keep it open and hopeful, but still skeptical mind. And don't wait for this concept of motivation to expand your social network or to exercise. That kind of gets in the way. Just do it. Live your best life now. And with that, I think we're running out of time. And I thank you for your attention. And I like the concept of expect nothing but appreciate everything because that will improve your attitude. I also provide my contact information in case you want to write me about something in specifically. Um, again, this will be up uh, as a YouTube video at some point in the near future. So feel free to contact me. And with that, I'm going to stop my screen share and pass it over to Eden for questions. Excellent, thank you. Do you have some questions? I'm going to start with one that came in a little bit later, only because we just got done chatting about it. Um, you know, you kind of talked about not not disease modifying. Someone said my neurologist has said that all current medications only improve the symptoms, but do nothing to stop the disease itself. Is this correct? And I, I know that that is correct, but I was hoping you would expand a little bit. Yes. I mean, the search for disease modifier is a tough one. Even for exercise, where over and over again, you see things written up that say, exercise is the only thing that's disease modifying. Recognize what a high bar that is to show that something is disease modifying. You really need to have a marker. Like uh, today, I uh, like a uh, uh, DAT scan, which is a kind of method of looking at the dopaminergic activity in the substantia nigra part of the brain, and you have to be able to see it change, right? There is a study going on now that plans to do just that, but that study is not out there yet. The other way that you might show disease modification is by having people exercise for two years and then stop until their VO2 max or their aerobic capacity gets back to what it was like before. Right, that takes a really long time. So in general, attempts at showing disease modification, whether it's your exercise or anything else, require a high bar of information and a long time of study. Okay. Somebody is asking, is the DAT scan definitive? That's and I am going to go back, by the way, to the original, to earlier questions, but while this one just came up and it was related, yeah. I do want to. Well, it's controversial, depends upon who's reading it, depends upon whether it's done quantitatively or eyeball, depends upon the experience of the radiologist. Okay, so I would say no, because essentially this is a clinical syndrome and it's diagnosed by the clinician who, who assuming that they have the relevant expertise, they're the bottom line, all right? But what do you make of somebody who doesn't respond to levodopa, which is another gold standard, okay? If you don't respond to levodopa, well, is it just because they haven't given you a hard enough dose or is it because you don't have Parkinson's? So you sort of look for a convergence of all this kind of information. Um, and I would not say that that scan read by a, by a radiologist who does it three or four times a year and doesn't have markers and isn't trained to be calibrated against other uh, radiologists, that's not so definitive, all right? But sometimes it's actually only approved uh, by the FDA to distinguish between um, essential tremor and Parkinson's, all right? Not for anything else, okay? Questions asked, is there a good animal model for Parkinson's? 
they're getting better. Okay, I can say that. I wouldn't say it's, it's not a question of good and not good. They've now started to develop a Parkinson's model uh, in animals in which I believe that the animal can have uh, developed neuromelanin uh, around or within its dopaminergic neurons. So that would be a major improvement, but we have to recognize that the human brain is so much more complex than the mouse brain. So animal models will have their place, but their limitations. We had one question, but you kind of addressed it because someone said, how close is science to finding a cure? And you kind of said, that's probably not going to happen. So are there some promising treatments out there? Yeah. Well, again, treatments, I think that uh, for most people, when we talk about deep brain stimulation, that's amazing. There are other surgical interventions that at least for the motor symptoms can be extremely helpful. All right. In terms of cure, I'm also coming from the perspective of somebody who spent her initial training in psychiatric epidemiology. And here, we need to recognize that there has not been a cure for any psychiatric condition. There is symptom management, but things involving the brain, we still need more basic science research on how the brain functions as a system. And if we target with a pill, one process, it's unlikely to work. We're probably gonna be dealing with a cocktail of different kinds of medications or treatments to really make a difference. And we're not there yet, all right? So I don't expect a cure in my lifetime, all right? I'm 68 years old, I hope I'm wrong, all right? But that's my perspective as somebody who's looked at the research and I don't see that coming in the near future. Speaking of some clinical trials, um, Within the RCT construct, are people restricted from following other regimens beyond the two or three they are assigned? Because that's how you get into multiple variables that you were talking about. Well, it depends, all right? Some say, you know, if you're obviously, if you're taking medication, you have to agree to stay on that same dosage for the course of the trial, okay? And some will say, you know, they really want to look at people before they start medication. And there's a lot of competition for those individuals who have a period in which they're not taking meds. And sometimes one of the outcomes is, does the uh, experimental intervention increase the length of time before people need to start their meds? All right. So uh, in terms of whether or not, I think when you consider, uh, there, there's a site, uh, clinicaltrials.gov as well as Michael J. Fox uh, has a uh, clinical trials finder uh, that can point you in the direction of various clinical trials that are out there. But there's other kinds of research that aren't necessarily interventions that you might be helpful by participating in it. Um, and look carefully about the inclusion and exclusion criteria because some have especially those from pharma have extensive inclusion and exclusion criteria, okay, including co-treatments as they call them, whether you can or cannot. For example, this huge exercise trial that's being funded by National Institutes of Health uh, coming out of Northwestern, that um, you can't have exercise regularly beforehand. That's really frustrating, okay? So, you know, it depends about the other interventions that you can or cannot use. Somebody had asked, someone asked, um, do you have an example of recent discoveries that you find scientifically believable? But I don't want you to approach the question that I want you to kind of, as you said, skeptically, so for example, like when you presented that one about the gentleman said, I have Parkinson's symptoms. And I, I immediately fixated on that as you did as well. What is kind of your process as you're reading something and you're kind of like, hmm, okay. what I is start, going through your head? Okay, I start at the top of the pyramid. Okay, if it's there, 
if that clinical trial is there or multiple clinical trials are there, and that reaches different conclusions and things lower in the pyramid, I default to the upper part of the pyramid. That's truer in terms of cause effect relationships. Okay. So that would, before I identify a specific promising treatment, that's my general headset. If we're talking about, uh, you know, animal studies, I think they're, the, they're so often the most misleading. Okay. And um, certainly, you know, test tube studies, a lot of false hopes raised by that especially in, in you know, uh, uh, lay language summaries. I, I hate for people to get their hopes up and then have them dashed, all right? So at least let's look for well-done clinical trials with replications. Okay. Any other questions? Bit more about the replications. Um, how, how do you know, does it usually say something that this is a not so much a replication, but that we're well, the problem is sometimes replications are difficult because nobody wants to fund them, right? They say, Oh, we already know that, right? But generally, what you want to see is uh, two different phases of clinical trials, which I I could do a whole lecture on that, all right? So I won't, but um, you know, you start off with a small clinical trial or a phase two study, let's call it, after you've established safety. And then when it, things look really promising, then you roll it out to a much larger sample. All right. And that's where sometimes things that you found in the smaller trial don't seem to hold up in a larger trial. That happened with CoQ10 many years ago. And that was very, very disappointing for many folks who were actively purchasing this specific brand of CoQ10 that had been used in the earlier smaller study and it didn't hold up. Okay. So I'm not, I don't even remember what the question was, but that's sort of my answer anyway. You want to see that it does um, you know, that it is replicated and that it is um, yes. and oh actually and then also there are also systematic reviews and what they call meta-analytic studies in which they combine results. And you'll see they're called a meta-analysis or something like that. And so there's summaries of multiple studies that are out there, all right? And those are really, that's the very top of that pyramid. And sometimes there aren't enough studies out there to do a meta-analysis, which is actually a, statistic, a statistical technique of combining data from multiple smaller clinical trials, okay? Thank you so much for your time. This has been incredible. Yeah, the feedback is so great in the chat. Um, as always, well, first, I want to make sure everybody does save their chat as they can see, because there were some information put in the chat. And if you'd like to, um, Calissa put Karen's Facebook information in the chat as well, if you're interested in joining that group. Um, you want to go down to the bottom and you'll see three little dots next to a little smiley face. And if you click on that, a pop-up will appear and it will allow you to um, save your chat. So you definitely wanna do that. Here at PMD Alliance, we have a tradition, our wave of gratitude. Thank you so much for your assistance today, your time Thanks. today, this has been excellent. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. All right, take care.